Hello everybody and welcome to the very professionally recorded 97% fire. We are seven weeks into converting a dining room and a small office into a home recording studio. Today we should be focusing on guitar and basses. No stairway, denied. Okay, first things first, this is the bass amp we will be using. I shall just move the state-of-the-art CCTV. Let's, oh, now, oh, mic's everywhere. What we're going to do is... Can you see that okay? Yes, you can. Right, start by wiring up the back of the amp with my box of cables. Now in the first video we did a room clearance time lapse where we basically got really good, emptied all the room, nice and neat and tidy, but the actual reality of it is, is it all got chucked in the living room just in a huge great box and now I can't find anything, which is great. See this, people laugh but this is the importance of labelling stuff, I found that lead. So we're going to need a speaker lead, an XLR cable, a guitar lead, and another speaker lead, and a power cable. Now you remember in earlier videos, when we set up the control room, it was advised Hello. You remember in earlier videos when we set up the control room, it was advised not to put speakers in the corners of rooms. Well, there's no real place it can go other than the corner room, so we're going to have to live with it. This is the importance of labouring your stuff. So, and put the power in first. And these are actual the leads it came with. unbalanced speaker leads. Now this has two speaker outs, an 8 ohms top, input there, and the second socket is if you have another speaker with or another cabinet with the same size speakers. And then we have our second speaker out. That goes into the input, not the extension, of the base cabinet. Now effects send and return we're not going to use at the minute, but we are going to use the direct out, which is a built-in DI box. Now this has a pre and post and it also has a ground lift on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an XLR cable from the back of the base amp and that's going to go straight into the floor box and that will be a DI straight into the mixing desk. So let's label that up quick. Oh, labelling. So when we push all this back, we know exactly where it goes. The reason why I didn't put base DI is because I have an actual base DI box as well. Okay, so that's good for now. And pop that back. <laughs> Let's see if I can move you for a better shot. Apologies if the audio goes weird. This camera does not like being moved.
Okay, hopefully you can see that better from there. Now we're going to talk about microphones. We are slowly running out of microphones. Now when you position your mic, as you may know already, you're going to get different tones more or less mids and highs, depending on where you position it in relationship to the speaker. Also, you're going to get more speaker, more room, depending where you position it in the room. Now we're going to go for a close micing technique here. In terms of the, the bottom cabinet, this has got a 15 inch speaker in it. Now you can treat that very much like a kick drum. And we're going to use this AKG D112 mic. Now, I've not actually have a clip for this, so I've used the pencil mic clip, which you don't currently need. And I'm going to mic this up in a similar way than we would to a bass drum. So we're going to go nice and close and just, can you see that? Just on the edge of the cone. And again, the closer or further away we get, we'll determine how much direct and indirect sound there is. Now because we're using two microphones at the same time, what I'm going to try and do is line these up so they're in a straight line and that will hopefully reduce any delay between either the signals reaching the mics and therefore reduce phase issues. Now this, of course, can be altered later once we've listened to the bass recording in context with the other bass microphones, the direct input microphone and of course the drums. So we're going to put the bottom bass channel into floor box small floor box number two and we're going to need a bigger stand now we've got any more stands we have one big stand left one tall stand left so uh, let's put that in there And we'll go for the top speaker to get some separation. We'll go for the edge of the cone. That'll do for now. Again, these can all be altered once we've had a listen to it. Uh, and that lead is not long enough. Let's get a bigger lead. Okay, so purely for illustration purposes, this is not something that I would actually do, but if I turn off the big light, and turn on the little light, hopefully you can just see it's quite hard, you've got black mics and black stands pointing at a black speaker. But you can see the red line shows that we've tried to keep this, the microphones in line and also at the same point of the speaker. And also, if we look from the side, you should be able to see that the diaphragms are a similar distance. That's your upper tool. The diaphragms are a similar distance from the cone to help with phase. Now obviously if you weren't trying to explain that you wouldn't need a laser level. Okay we're on wobbly cam which my lapel mic notoriously dislikes, so apologies if we start to crackle. As you can see, you've got the D112 
mic at the bottom and then you've got your SM57 at the top. Now they are in line with each other in both directions to help with phase issues. We can of course move these later once we've tested the signal. And what we've also done is we've put a guitar lead into the input. Now all of these leads go down across the snake and into the small floor box. So we've got floor box, small floor box one is the SM57, two is the D112, three is the DI, and then this purple cable here is going to be the input. Now that of course goes next door and that's actually wired to the back of the tuner. So I can just plug whatever I want to play into the tuner, tune the guitar or the bass. And away we go. All right, next up, the Lonely Marshall Stack. So we move on to the Marshall Valve Amplifier. Now we've got a few choices for capturing guitar and bass tones. So we could use the pod. We also have a Sparks digital amp that has loads and loads and loads of amp bottling on. We also have uh, the Sans amp built into the mixing desk, which also has amp bottling. But because we're noisy and we like rock music, we're going to go for the Marshall Stack. Now, this clearly is slightly larger than the amp required for a dining room. This is of course a leftover from my days as a touring rock star. And we use used mainly playing to handfuls of people in and around Kent. Your course could use anything you like if you have a cool black star amp, a Vox, something like that. Actually, while we're here, if I move this out of the way, you can see uh, <laughs> there are the poorly drilled hole that goes through to the control room. There's a HDMI cable for the repeater screen. That is an Amazon Fire Stick, so we can watch. Diesel Creek, or your favourite YouTube channel. So, first thing, so let's see if I can do this so you can sit. Oh, it's ripped. Nightmare. A much more sensible amp for this would be like a Marshall Combi, something like that. I had a friend who lent me a Marshall Combi once. And I stored it when I was moving house. And the shelf I stored it on collapsed. And it fell to the floor and it got smashed up. And all the uh, all the speaker grill became ripped. Luckily the uh, Marshall the Marshall Amp Factory is only just down the road from me in Milton Keynes and they do this really cool factory tour which I did for my birthday last year thank you wife and we went round and we had a look at all the manufacturing process and they've got a studio there and they sell drum kits and fix stuff and they got a museum with the original Marshall stacks in and some of Zach Wilde's rigs it's really cool Highly recommended. We'll revisit that later with some proper equipment. Oh my lord, they make them so heavy. Okay, so the same thing again. We shall plug in the leads first. Just hold that. Now we need a speaker connector. So we're going to go, this is the cable that came with the amp, 16 ohms, 
mono. Now we have a foot switch. Oh, look at that. Marshall goodness. Let's put it up there. I'm not going to worry about the effects loop at the minute. And finally, we have an emulation out, which is probably Marshall for DI. So we're going to do something slightly different on this. We're going to go left and right from the microphones. I'll explain that in a moment. And this, so that will be for box four and five will be left and right. And then floor box six will be the DI. And then that leaves seven and eight XLR inputs free for if we wanted to do keyboard or acoustic guitar, something like that. And the same thing again with the input. We will actually come from the input around the back of the amp and then that will go into the floor box and position B which is also linked to the guitar tuner next door so we can there play next door and use this room effectively as an isolation space or we could indeed just come in and pull this out right. Floor box <coughs> again. We'll put it here for now, but we could as easily feed that through the hole in the wall and control it from next door. Because the next thing we need to do is the microphones. So, in terms of guitar mic in. We are really, really running out of microphones. So, so we have a SM57, and ideally I was going to use two of these in a thing called the Freeman technique. Now what that is, is you take one microphone and you point it at a noise source, and then you take another microphone that's exactly the same, this is not exactly the same, and you point that at the same noise source, but then you change the angle of one of the microphones and what that will do is it will give you two different tones in the microphone, one a bit more bass, one a bit more fill, and you can blend to taste and it gives you a really good Kujungan rock tone. Now you can get a special clip that allows you to connect two SM57s. Now I've only got one SM57 but Luckily for me, thanks to my tom stand breaking, I do have two of these, the PGA 56, which on the Shaw website they say you can use for snares and toms, not unlike an SM57. So what we're going to do is we're going to try this technique. Now, because I haven't got the proper clip and I've borrowed some mathematical equipment from my son's pencil case, what I've done is drawn a centre line on a piece of plastic and then I've drawn two angles but that gives you a 55 degree spread. Now that is what supposedly the optimum angle of this microphone technique is. So using a bank card of your choice, I don't know if you can see that, it's got the lines on it. I'm going to cut this Love a bit of arts and crafts like so and that should give me exactly 55 degrees hopefully you can see and just so I know which end's which I'm going to punch using one of my favourite toys
a hole in the middle, which gives you not only a free plectrum, but also the direction which you need to hold the angle finder. Now with that I can find out exactly where the correct angle for these mics is. I can also pop the cable through it and just leave it dangling so they get knocked. I don't need to go and steal things from my son's pencil case again. So there. Hopefully this is a K and M multi angled stand. That's the middle of the speaker, there's the edge of the speaker. And then try recording and seeing if I can blend between the two tones and see what happens. And the last cable is a different colour lead. Right, now of course we'll need to test all of that, but that concludes the Marshall Amp setup. And then finally, if we go back to Arts and Craft Corner. Always good to keep all these old credit cards and stuff. Very handy for making plectrums. Especially if you tend to lose plectrums. On here we will have, although we're not going to wire it in directly, we should have the Sparks amp. Now I would like to demonstrate the Sparks Amp, but unfortunately the software to demonstrate it happens to be on the iPad that I'm using as a camera. So what we have done is, as before, uh, you saw that we made a drum group folder. We have done the same thing for the bass. So we're going inputs 25, 26, 27. And in the notes we've put what the microphones are. I have done a new line list. So these are the outputs and then the inputs. And you can see where it gets slightly confusing because the UI24R input number one is Pro Tools input 11, the large floor box number one. And as you go down, input 15 is actually Pro Tools input 25, and that is the small floor box number one. So I've done a definitive list of what is going where, and the mics that are in there. So we have now got a bass stem and we have a guitar stem. So we have basically the bass top, bottom mics and DI, the guitar top, bottom mics and DI, the drums we've already seen. And in channel one and two, I've added the acoustic guitars with the STC 10 mics that we need to test to see if they are usable. And this will be either an XY or a high-low pair that can go on the acoustic guitar or as drum overheads. Now, if we look at that in Pro Tools, you can hear... That 
that's the drums we did last week. Now, I've done the same thing on the UI24R, so I can actually access that now via a browser on the computer. So I've done some groups here, mute groups. And what that means is if I want to just record uh, the drums, for example, I can press mute group one and that will turn everything muted. So this is drums only. So all the other things are muted and so on. So I can turn it off and I could go to mute group three, which is TSL. So triple super lead, that's the Marshall stack with the microphone at zero degrees. And that's the Marshall stack with the microphone at 55 degrees. And then the Marshall stack DI. So we now have a group for each one which is wonderful and I've also named all of these so you've got AC high low toms bass snare so on and they match the naming conventions AC high low toms bass snare of the Pro Tools so they are both now set as uh, set and forget folders so we should be able to come in open up the mix and desk and it will be default set to this and then open up Pro Tools which will be default set to this and then in theory all we have to do is arm the track that we want to play so we go for drums and so click the drum group hit arm and record and that's it right so the next thing to do is to test the guitars and the bass for signal so we'll do that now so we are on wobbly cam and i am wearing not one but two lapel mics in a hope that i can stop the glitching i actually just basically need to buy a proper camera and not film all this stuff on an ipad but we can't at the minute so what we're going to do is we're going to play the bass via the purple lead which we know goes through the floor box next door and then into the speakers through the microphones and we'll be able to see that recorded in Pro Tools and we'll be able to control that via the digital mix and desk interface which is there. Now interesting fact people talk about recording studios and how it's important to get lows, noise, floors and all the rest of it. This is not a soundproof room. But listen to the noise this amp makes. So there is of course a thing called psychoacoustic masking. Where a really loud sound, like a lion, is the usual example. Will mask or hide a quiet sound. For example, a mouse squeaking. So what I'm going to do to mask the sound of the bass amp fan is play the bass amp really loudly. Of course, I can always use noise gates and stuff at the point of capture. Now, let's pop back into the control room. Now, that cable comes in down there from the bass. And it says bass there and tuner. So it goes through that cable and then into the back of the guitar tuner. And out of the guitar tuner and into the guitar. All the other way around. <laughs> right. Here we go. Brace yourself. Oh, excuse me. Not that type of video. Okay, so hopefully you can see the bass that we just saw is plugged in next door. We can see the screen. This is connected to our microphones. And then we have signal. So we're looking at the bass high, which is this in 57, bass low, and the bass DI. So we've got good signals on all of those. Lovely, that's the gain staging. It's a bit easier to see on this because I've muted the other channels. So it's these three.
And in terms of EQ and compression and stuff, so this is the SM57, so this is the top mic. So we've got a bit of EQ, bit of compression, bit of gating. So you can see, you can hear it here, but you can see the noise floor from the fan. Yeah, so if I drop that down, you can actually see the representation of the fan. Can you see that? So what we've done is we've just put a noise gate on and we've pulled it in until we just lose the noise floor, but you still get the full signal. So we've done that on all the channels for the bass. Uh, and that is the bass DI. Probably don't need so much gate on that. Okay. All right. Now behind me. Right, wobbly cam, excuse me. Not sure if you pick that up or not. But behind me we have Pro Tools. So Pro Tools is now recording. Are we getting the signal in? camera down slightly. You might be able to see it all happening at the same time.
So the other thing to do is to have a quick, quick look at the phase. Let's see where we are. We have a peak and a peak and a peak. So we're not far. We're slightly out of time. So there's a slight time difference between the 57 on the top and the base low mic. But the base low and the DI are spot on. So what I can do is I can move the 57 back just a touch. Uh, and that might be because the capsule is further in the mic than we thought, or the speakers might not be aligned. So just move it back a touch. We might just improve that slightly. So, so we'll try and do the same thing again. But this time we shall turn off the bass amp. And we'll just unplug the lead from the floor box. We can plug it straight into the guitar, which we've already tuned. These are really old strings on this. So uh, I normally do this from next door. Really old strings. So you can see we've got good level. Oh, I forgot to get the mouse. So the eagle-eyed audio enthusiasts amongst you will have noticed a fundamental flaw, which is an amplifier, which is designed to take a small signal and make it mahusive, and a television receiver, which is designed to receive a signal. So we've got a thing receiving a signal right next to a thing that boosts the signal. It's a bit noisy. But what we would normally do is play this next door, and this screen wouldn't be on. This is more for the drums and things like that. But who wants to sit down in an office playing guitar when you can stand in front of an amp? Right, so same thing again. We're going to test just for signal level in. <laughs> So you can see all as well, the DI is a little bit low. All right, so I've just increased the DI level slightly. I was hoping to do this, control of the UI24R on this screen. So it'd be really easy to see what's going on. But Pro Tools and their infinite wisdom of making everything better, uh, means you can't not be on the internet with my version, or it um, saves and turns itself off. The UI25 is on a different Wi-Fi system, so I need to blend the two together and all will be well. Okay, so you can see now we have much more even gain. So, if I hit record...
Okay, and if we do a quiet one. Okay, so I will chop those up and I shall play those uh, three times so you're better to hear the direct mic at zero degrees, the blended mic at 55 degrees, the Veeman technique, and the DI. And then what I might do is change the awful guitar strings, which are probably two or three years old, because I've just got this out of storage. Uh, maybe next time I'll do a comparison of old strings and new strings, so you can hear um, how much better new strings are. Back to the studio. So there you go. That is it for this episode. Um, I hope you found it useful. As always, all the test recordings will be on the website, which you can download for free. Uh, remember, they are test recordings. So the whole point of it is things like uh, we found out that the DI from the Marshall stack was indeed 180 degrees up face, so we can check that. We can also see there is nothing currently next door, and we can see the levels of noise that we've got on some of the mic channels, so we can address these types of problems. And we can also decide whether or not we want to use two TomTom -tom microphones on the Marshall stack, or whether we'd be better off with just the one SM57. So 97% fire our website. And then I go to audio and downloads. These are the impulse response files from before. And I've made it a bit easier to find. So we've got the clean bass test recordings that you've just heard. So the 57, the D111. Uh, the DI and all three of them together and the same type of thing for the electric guitar and for the clean guitar these are genuine first takes so I've left in all the dodgy guitar playing and that so you can actually listen to real examples rather than me spending ages editing it up and pretending to be much better than I am. If you know anyone who would be interested, please do share the video, especially if someone would like to subscribe. That would be amazing. We're aiming for a thousand subscribers. Very exciting indeed. Um, on the next episode, we will probably be uh, finalising the Pro Tools mixing stage and mastering stage. And we might even record a bit of proper music. And also, I'll be going through how 
we get the sounds from here to next door properly so doing headphone mixes and having click tracks that we can play along with all that sort of stuff okay well thanks for watching see you next time